Hello and welcome to the Ask the Industry podcast, episode 97. I'm comedian Simon Kane, and for those of you new to the show, this is the podcast where I interview the most influential people from the worlds of stand-up, comedy, radio, and today, film. Peter Fellows is a film writer, actor, producer, director, and basically anything that is involved in the movie-making process, from the script to the post-production to the organisation of screenings. I got him on to talk about his two careers that he's been running in tandem, namely his indie film work and now his mainstream success as a writer and producer of comedy content with some of the biggest names in comedy, with some of the biggest and most famous names in comedy writing. If you've ever wondered what the real value is of making something just because you want to make something and because it's what you want to do and where it can lead for you, this is the episode for you. The most interesting part for me was his aversion to being on social media and how that has helped and impacted his choices in his career and working life and his personal life. Regular listeners will know that I'm always talking about social media and I'm interested in building audiences online. So having someone on who has almost no online profile was really interesting, especially as they're doing extremely well in their field and they're not letting things like like, comments and shares impact their choices. Sadly, I'm not as detached as him from the internet. So if you are new here, please do hit the subscribe button as I do two new episodes a month on the first and third Fridays. If you're old here, please, 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 please do give it an honest review in iTunes. If your honest review is positive, I don't want any, I don't want any negative reviews, obviously. But a, uh, an honest, positive review would be great. They help the show out. They help get great guests on, and basically everything else. So if you can add a bit of social proof to this podcast, please do. If you can't donate, that is the quickest way of helping out the show and keeping it going. So if you value this and you value my work, please, please support it. And if you don't want to do that, just share this episode episode with someone that you think will get some value out of it. Oh, and do join the Facebook group because that is the only place that you can ask your questions to future guests via my mouthpiece. And I've got some bloody amazing guests coming on this year. So please join it now because I do get emails almost every time there's a new episode out that someone wanted to ask a question on saying, well, I didn't know. You do know I tell you all the time, join the Facebook group. And if you really can't join Facebook, email me. But that is the last resort if you're not on it. My email is simon.m.kane at gmail.com. But for now, without any more delays, this is Peter Fellows. There we go. Right, okay. <laughs> so I, you have no idea how frustrating it is. <laughs> I do. Yeah, you do. <laughs> Only in camera terms rather than audio. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, uh, I, used to, I used to record video stuff and it was hell. Like, yeah, I, 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 I'm about to do a new project, and uh, I, I'm working with a YouTuber on it specifically because I know he knows how. To. Yeah, just to you hate him, you hate him. You just <laughs> he's a dick. You just uh, you just don't want to have to deal with the cameras. This will have come out by the time we've done it. So yeah, 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 yeah. why not? Why it's a massive prick. Massive prick. Um, um, or lovely guy, depending on. Depending you know, on just cut this out. how you like. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I was, I was just saying that you've you've managed to create two careers in tandem that are kind of every every so often overlapping yes i think it's it's possibly just timing in that <laughs> because i'm you kind of have been to be, s- trying to be modest is that what it is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i think it's just it's timing and technology you know we've just you've just fiddled with uh, an sd card for five minutes and it's the but it's the same thing of you know now we can create stuff ourselves very easily pretty cheaply and because that's how I started in that, you know, someone lent me a camera and I really enjoyed making stuff. I've carried on doing that. But in the meantime, I've also had a career in the industry properly that I get paid for. So I've sort of continued doing both. And, and at times they've they've crossed over. It's a strange thing because it they're both very different from one another. But at their core, they are the same thing. At the end of the day, you're going to create an episode of TV or video you put on YouTube and people are going to just watch it or not watch it. And they're going to enjoy it or not enjoy it or find it funny or not find it funny. It kind of doesn't matter how much money there is or isn't because it is at the end of the day the same thing there's just less risk if there's no money involved what do you mean there's less risk well there's not someone who's put in four million dollars or whatever to finance a feature film that then has failed and lost them the money if you've not paid any money towards or you've you know you've put in a grand or something to make a short film you probably won't see that grand again but that's not kind of, that's not why you're doing it i guess it's more to open doors further down the line which will inevitably get you your money back in a more abstract way yeah 
yeah, I got asked the other day about this, and they said, oh, it's probably a great way of getting to know people. And I was like, yeah, that's, I thought that's what they were all, all podcasts are for, that, surely. Yeah. What, yeah. what are people getting out of it? I mean, it's yeah. unless they just really love having conversations with people, it's a good excuse. <laughs> yeah, it's a good excuse to... Um, it would be strange for you... Well, actually, I suppose some people do do this, where they ask some, they ask a well-known person or you know someone that they're interested in if they can have a conversation with them a cup of tea but yeah I, I suppose recording it does lend it some legitimacy otherwise it's a bit kind of yeah come into my house for a conversation are you gonna leave at any point why are you taking off your clothes um no i, I don't do that all oh, that mm, mm. oh it feels nice oh yeah carry on we carry said, on we said we wouldn't talk about it again uh, yeah but you are <laughs> i mean i'm surprised you can speak so clearly with what your mouth's doing at the moment um but uh, as soon as uh, I've ejaculated, I'll, I'll, I'll feel the massive shame that I usually do and we expect you to get the fuck out. Of my mouth or of the flat? Uh, both. Both. Right, okay, that seems reasonable. Um, yeah, no, but um, yeah, I can't I remember what the original point was. Uh, oh yeah, it's, it's an excuse, it? good excuse to get through doors, isn't it? Um, Literally in your case. I'm, yeah. I'm in your house. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, the two, the two things have kind of run as separate but sometimes overlapping. So, so maybe if we start, so... Your first thing, you were just lent a camera. So the first stuff I did, I mean, I'd, my dad had a like an, an old tape camera, which I, I'd used to make kind of animation with stop motion animation stuff with like Playmobil and toys and things. But it, it didn't have any sort of narrative structure. How old were you? Oh, I don't know, like seven, eight and you hadn't worked on a narrative structure. I know, I know, yeah. pathetic. Yeah, yeah. It's just an idiot, just a stupid little twat. Um, but me, me and my brother did a thing called, uh, which we called Rubbish TV USA, which was where we'd run around with the camera and do kind of, I guess, like MTV-inspired pieces to camera and stupid bits. And that was perhaps arguably a bit more <laughs> comedic or a bit more like something that you would, if it had been 10 years later, would have gone onto YouTube. But I, I, I kind of enjoyed doing it, but didn't consider it as, to be a thing that anyone does as a job. Not that anyone thinks about what job they're really going to do when they're seven or eight. Then when I was about 15, 16, I was volunteering at a youth club, which was for much younger children. And they wanted to put me and another guy into a scheme with MTV, who used to do this thing called MTV. TV boom, which I think was fairly short lived, but the, the idea of it was that they would get a load of kind of 16, 17, 18 year olds in, give them all quite cheap cameras and a train a couple of days of training, and then you would go and film some stuff and send your projects to MTV, who would then put it on their website or put it on TV. I don't, yeah, I mean, we didn't have MTV, so I don't know whether anything was ever broadcast from any of those projects. I mean, the, the, the cameras were very low quality, so it seems unlikely, but because it's just the broadcasting standards. I made a thing then for this youth club, but in the meantime, there was a youth worker. I knew called Michael Johnson who had a slightly better camera which he lent to me and I started making sort of short and longer films. I, I did art A level. The exam board that we were on there was a piece of small print which said you could make video projects so I just uh, just abused that and um, convinced my art teacher to allow me to make films rather than just doing paintings and drawings and stuff and she was great she was really encouraging of that probably because I was quite an annoying little shit anyway so it was like oh that gets that distracts him it gets him out of the way of the other the other kids who can then concentrate but um, yeah I don't know and then from there I realized oh that's this is what I want to do so yeah then I went to uni and did a course called script writing for film and tv at Bournemouth which is quite well known for industry jobs and kind of alumni who've done fairly well they're very good for animation so they've got like hundreds of credits on all the star wars films and gravity and stuff like that yeah and all the in the meantime i was doing lots of running work really the first stuff i got work experience wise was off the back of the mtv scheme and then i just carried on doing that in the meantime so it started that was where it sort of started sort of veering off in a the weird direction of one day being working with a well-known director or well-known actors and then the next day being at uni or at school filming stuff with my mates and they're both I think they were both useful for each other really so I'm, I'm literally looking up a question so <laughs> if, if you're wondering why I keep doing that it's <laughs> no, no, it's going on to... just checking uh, just checking Twitter yeah 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 
Uh, who's this? He's a twat. I'll tell him. I'll tell him. Uh, <laughs> um, I was just looking up because I know your most recent mainstream project was working on the death of Stalin. Yeah. And I was I was the vanity project, but you've done Year Nine House Party. That's out now, isn't it? Uh, not well, quite. Not quite. Yeah, but it's, it's been um, a festival. No, Year Nine House okay. Parties. Uh, it's picture locked, but we're just working on the score. Right. And the sound mix at the moment. If someone is listening who doesn't know any jargon, do you want to say that in a layman's way? Uh, yeah, so Year 9 House Party is a sort of 22-minute short film, which is sort of a bit like a pilot episode in that it sets up the world and universe of uh, of the, uh, the characters and uh, the kind of concept of the idea, which is essentially grown adults playing 13-year-olds at their first drunken house party. So you could kind of see how you could do that with some well-known kind of comic faces in their 30s, 40s, 50s, um, with each week taking place at a different character's parents' house or whatever, and kind of playing the idea of what's it like being an adolescent and coming of age, but in this uh, kind of comedic scope where you're able to say things via an adult's voice, but in the kind of articulate it as if it was a child which is quite fun so it's a, a bit like Dennis Potter doing Blue Remembered Hills but with uh, lots of swearing and uh, <laughs> people being sick and shitting into stuff yeah so in layman's terms picture lock means when you've the actual visuals of what you see on screen won't change again the grade is where you change the colours of the picture uh, which you do after you've locked picture otherwise you end up grading stuff and wasting time on things that get cut again sound mix you wait till after you've locked just because otherwise you end up planning for for scenes that don't make it into the final project you waste time doing foley which is where you record all the sound effects then they don't get used so you kind of save all of that stuff to the very end which we call the online. Offline is up until the picture lock. The score is just the music that's going, that's being written by a great composer called Steve Hickling. Plug. Yeah, look him up. Look up his SoundCloud. Uh, and, and this is meant in the nicest way possible. I think he'll be easier to find than you because you, <laughs> you have no social media <laughs> and like very little imprint online like i found your imdb and your page on your agent's website which i think has nothing on it No, it has nothing on it yeah <laughs> you're li- you're literally the most hidden person yeah and we've talking about or like put like behind the scenes given that you have a track record record of making independent films as well as sort of bigger blockbuster films you recently did a crowdfunding thing how was that without social media <laughs> it was it was Okay, actually. I mean, we, we, we got the funding. We got the funding yeah. and we went actually quite, we went over by 20%, I think. And then actually, as a result of that, we then got more money because I think people felt like, oh, right, this isn't a failure. I can not be embarrassed about putting some money into it. But um, the thing with that is that it, it, I just contacted everyone individually that I have met over the last five years. And, you know, some people obviously didn't get back to you. A lot of people do and I don't know it felt less it was a lot of work tailoring emails and texts and phone calls to different people rather than just putting out a Facebook status or something like that and I think actually maybe that's why it worked because if you're just putting out if you're just spamming people's news feeds I think there's a risk that people can go oh it doesn't matter it's just a thing like it's a bit annoying. They can feel validated in their annoyance because it's just a thing that you're pushing without actually tailoring it to them and making it interesting for them, showing them that what they'll get out of it. But also, I don't know, I just, I, I think that there's something to be said for being in the real world and just, just trying to have friends and meet people and retain friendships. Like I'm, I'm quite lucky in that I, I do have quite a few groups of friends and I feel like I do know some people who are locked into Twitter. It's like they lost the capacity to sit down and make eye contact with someone in a pub and have a conversation and talk about politics without just screaming their opinions in 140 character bursts and it being a conversation rather than just, here's what I think. Now, fuck off. I'm going to block you if you disagree with me. I just, as soon as that stuff started evolving, as soon as Twitter started evolving into that about five, six, seven years ago, I was just, I just felt, I do have Twitter, but it's private and I don't really tweet anything. I don't definitely don't tweet anything political or really opinionated. I, I usually just retweet stuff that I think is good, you know, if I've seen a film or something, or stuff to do with my own projects, which is probably quite boring for anyone who follows me, but they don't have to follow me, and I don't know why they do, really. Not sure what they're getting out of it. Facebook, I stopped because I just... 
it just depressed me too much to see people who I respect and like spouting such ignorant views on things that they just didn't know about and just kind of you know sharing the sort of Britain first content without understanding the context of what it was or what it was saying or that the fact it was before we had the term fake news and you know in the early days of Facebook I would try and uh, have a conversation with people on there and now things have just changed the collective mindset has changed people don't want to have a conversation they want to they want people to agree with them and they want to kind of curate their own echo chamber around them of people who just say yes and just agree and it's really poisonous (laughs) I think both personally and on a much wider sort of universal scale. No, I completely agree. I just found it interesting. I couldn't imagine networking without one of the two of those platforms. It's just hard for me to stay in touch with people, even though I'm not actively staying in touch in in such a personable way. Because I think when you get a message, uh, you've not been on it for a while, but when you get a Facebook message, I perceive that as less important sometimes than an email. Because, I don't know, I just I just always had this thing about email being quite, you know, like it's important to send when you actually have something to say kind of thing. Yeah, it's interesting. I know people who do lots of business via Facebook. And um, I think that's the thing. If you have a, if you do have your own business, then it, it you, you have to have Facebook and Twitter and Instagram um, because it's, what people look at now and it's because of the way that the the google algorithms work and everything if you if you type in the name of the business it's the first thing that will pop up usually so it makes sense for that side of things and i know people also who are in this industry who will get in touch with someone about a job on facebook because people change their email addresses they don't change their facebook accounts unless they've <laughs> unless they've been publicly shamed in a john ronson way and uh, and then have had to had to sort of start all over but um it makes sense and i don't know i it, i just get by fine it doesn't seem to affect my life at all i wasn't implying uh, no no but it's strange because it's you know it's that thing of we've spoken about it before i think what happens if you just what would happen if you just got rid of your Facebook? Do yeah. you think anything would actually change? Because if people want to get in touch with you, they will find a way of getting in touch with you. Yeah, people, I was off Facebook for a couple of weeks earlier this year and people, you know, text and WhatsApp eventually because yeah. they realised, oh, he's not replying. Yeah. And he hasn't posted, you know. Yeah. So, um, and my last post said, I'm taking a break, you know. So, yeah. so it took them a little while, but, you know, if, if you really wanted to get the message through, you could. I mean, I, I run a, uh, I run the largest group on Facebook for, for comedy writers, comedians, all that kind of stuff. And I had a moment the other day with the other admins where I said, should we just delete this? <laughs> should we just see what 13,000 people do if the group just goes? Yeah, you know? yeah. And, it was, and like, they were like, you can't delete. And I went, I, I actually can't. I've got the button. Like, yeah. I could do this if I wanted to. I could, I could be the Trump red button if I wanted to. Yeah. Kind of thing. Um, I, that I didn't, by the way. But like, it was a real <laughs> moment where I sort of thought to myself, I wonder, I wonder what it would be like yeah. to just lose this facility that everyone's been quite dependent on a lot of people. You know? It's interesting. I mean, it shows, it does sort of show the kind of the network, how small the network of people are in a community like that as well, because mm. that is presumably most people who are involved in comedy from the very kind of people who are considering becoming stand-ups right through to some of the top people or at least their staff, mm. probably, I would assume. But yeah, that's it's interesting. I, I don't know. I mean, the thing is, I'm not, I don't have much of a presence online and I'm sure at times it will, I will be pressured into doing more. Like, for example, with the Kickstarter, the producers of that short film wanted me to get one of the, one of the different ones back. So I got Instagram and... I've kept that just because of Stalin. So I've just been posting stuff just because there the wasn't... film Stalin, not... Yes, yeah. <laughs> Stalin's ghost actually uh, came and uh, told me that he would fuck me up if I didn't. Uh... But it's weird because you would think, why, why would he be interested in Instagram? But um, He's big on that. He's big, yeah. Um, he was, uh, was an attractive guy when he was young. He could have been, he an, he could have been an Instagram influencer, probably. When actually, I... he would have been very good at it, I would imagine. Yeah, when I when I left because I went to a screening of it, you invited me to, and when I, and when I left that, me and my friend who went to it, we were discussing how he did look quite not dapper, but you know, just quite um, well, chic. Yeah, he's yeah, chic. Yeah. He looks like he got his clothes from Mubi. Yeah, Mubi, not Mubi. No, Mu- uh, Mu- uh, Muji. Muji. Yeah, that's Muji. It. Yeah, because we then got onto which serial killers were hot when they were young, <laughs> and that is a rabbit hole you don't want to get down to oh yeah Um, there are quite a few there's a lot yeah yeah Uh, Fred West was alright wait is it Fred Mm. West who was the one the one the the one who paved over the bodies yeah yeah yeah, and good builder 
Is it? Yeah. Multi-talented. Yeah, yeah. Least you could say about him. Well, yeah. it's not the least you could say. About him. No, there's more. There's more that we should. Uh, He's got a long address. We won't. Um, I'll, I'll get him on a different podcast. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> cover his life work. Um, but yeah, because recently you've had you, you've you've been working on the the death of Stalin, and obviously earlier on the year you were doing a crowdfunding thing. Uh, you said that there's like less risk involved, obviously, because it means you're. But it means when you were crowdfunding, you were taking money from uh, smaller amounts, but from people. So did you still perceive that there was less risk? No, or? that's higher risk to me. Okay. Because it's because it's um it's the money of people that I know and care about or have professional dealings with but who who are actually one of uh, one of the rules that you hear early on in this industry is never put your own money into something. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, from producers that's what you'll hear and there's truth to that because the chances are most of the time you won't see it again. With a Kickstarter that obviously, you know, fundamentally is going against that rule and if most of the people that you know are in some way involved in this industry um <laughs> you're asking a lot potentially to to get money off them and also you care more because you you don't want to let everyone down it's kind of a good thing creatively because it means that you want the film to be as good as it can possibly be which i always want yeah, everything I that i do to be as good as it can possibly be but it's it's uh there's that slight thing sometimes when if you're not getting paid for something you get to a certain level of God, we've been working on this for two years and we could wait for this particularly good graphics designer to uh, do the credit sequence and it'll take six more weeks or we could just we could just put it out now. We could just do the credits on Final Cut and just put it out now. Fuck it, let's just do that because it saves... Everyone's waiting for it. All the cast want the footage for their reels, all this stuff. You know, there's that sort of thinking, which I think with something like this, you you, you kind of push you push everything a bit harder to make sure that it actually is every little detail is perfect. I'd say it's a good thing. With the death of Stalin, there is risk, but the risk isn't on me. It's on the producers and on Armando, who directed it. I suppose to some degree on the cast, because they will have typically better opportunities to be cast in things that they want to do should the film do well and be a commercial success. I guess that's the same for me, Ian and David, who wrote it, because people will be more interested in us and our scripts, you know, if the film does well. Yeah, I, I imagine once you've made the funding and everyone knew this is actually going to happen, including yourselves, it means that they're more likely to watch it as well because they've got a vested interest in the thing they've put some money That's in. it as well. You're buying an audience straight away. And it's uh, there's that additional thing of people people who are in the industry can go, oh, great, I put in a few quid, minimal effort for the price of a round of drinks or just like one drink in London. I was able to get credit on a, on a film. And so I can be proud of this without having to really feel like I've, had to do tons and tons and tons of work to to be a part of it equally if you're not in it if you're not in the industry it's presumably quite cool to be able to go look i'm a associate producer on a film starring a bond girl you know so there's that and yeah you just have the, the few hundred people who who put money in who want to see it which is great can't remember the exact rules with kickstarter i know if you i know on one of them if you don't make the funding you can't just you know. With Kickstarter, you lose all the money if you don't make the amount that you've set. Yeah. With Indiegogo, I think you get to keep the money. There's a sort of psychological push when it comes to Kickstarter in that, A, you're saying this project can only happen if we get this amount of money. And B, it's only worth making if we get this amount of money. And also, people, I think, feel like you know, in the final week, they kind of go, oh God, look, they might not make it. I've only put £10 in. I could just up, up that to 20 and that'll maybe push them over the over the limit. So I think it's good for all of those things if the project is strong. So would you have done it if you hadn't have made the money? Would you have just put the money in yourself? How would that have gone? We probably wouldn't have made the film, I don't think. Because it was quite far along when you started that. I mean, is, is there a point where... Because there have been, I've seen a lot of Kickstarters that are like, we've got this idea, we've got the talent, we've not got a script yet, would you like to fund it? Which is, for me, quite an early stage. Yeah, I think that's, a, it's a strange thing, it's a strange place to start if you, if you were doing that. Because it's, it's almost, you have to kind of, I, I think, this isn't, you know, you don't have to, I just think this. You have to prove that you've, uh, 
you've put the effort in. Otherwise, why should anyone else invest in you? You're, you've already invested your time or some of your money into making some material that, that shows what the project will be and what the final product is. You don't need any money to write a script. You don't even need a computer. <laughs> um, so there's kind of no excuse for not having written a script yet. Why would, why would I put money into a project that I have no idea about the content for? It seems mad to me and you know we would have if anyone had wanted to read the script before putting money in we would have happily have sent it to them a couple of people did because we felt it was a really strong piece of work which hopefully it is so let's let's go back to just when you were go, just after mtv and you said that sort of your first experience industry wise because i mean would you count the mtv thing because it feels like that was kind of more yeah i think because the people who were running the workshops were mtv directors and producers it um it did feel, it felt like it was proper, like rather than just, um, I don't know, just like a youth, like a youth leader with a with a video camera. Uh, what did you want to? What, sorry, what was? Well, that? I was, I was going to ask because we were talking about how your independent career has led to you getting a more mainstream career, and I was going to try and track the progress of how going out on your own and learning the skills meant that you were able to get into quite big positions in uh, uh, most recently quite a big blockbuster film that's literally just doing very well at the moment it's just practice by doing stuff yourself you know by writing if the more you write the better you get um the more you deal with actors doesn't matter if it's your mate tim who uh has gone to drama school but hasn't got anything or you know, is just likes acting. It doesn't matter really. It's it's dealing with people and understanding how to how to speak to to people and not be a dick and not offend people, whilst also to some degree manipulating them into doing what you need for the project. And not in a sort of Harvey Weinstein way. That sounded a bit, but um, but you know, just it's 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 people are actors are often quite sensitive and it's just dealing with them and it. Honestly, it doesn't feel like act- actors are very different from one another, whether they are very well known or whether they're amateur actors who are sort of doing a bit of extra stuff. You know, everyone's, they're all totally different in their own different ways, but there is a sort of, there are similarities. And it's strange sometimes how someone who's never made a penny from acting can be so much more difficult than someone who's done incredibly well and maybe it's because the person who's done incredibly well is lovely and that's why they've done so that's one of the reasons why they've done so well because they're talented but also they're not difficult whereas some people are just they're talented but they're just too difficult for it to be worth it and at some point there's a balance but anyway yeah in terms of learning stuff it's just just by practice Mm. so I would have been rubbish if I'd started working with Armando when I was 16 because I couldn't write whereas I'd had five years of trying to learn to write before I started working for him. So I had a kind of, at least a basis of for my of understanding for what works and what doesn't work and a kind of feeling for something's wrong with this script or there's something structurally that doesn't work. Equally with actual directing and producing, it's all problem solving producing. It's just how do we, okay, we've got a location that's set in a pub. How do we get that shot? We don't have any money. Um, okay, well, we can ring every pub that we can afford to get to without bumping up the budget to what we can't afford. So we'll ring every pub in the town. Okay, none of the pubs want to do it. Okay, what can we do instead? Well, if we rewrite it, it could be set in a cafe. Oh, yeah, my mate's cousin has a cafe or works in a cafe. We could ask them if uh, if we could shoot in there for half an hour. Oh, they've said you can only use it for 15 minutes. Okay, well, if we cut the scene down... You know, you learn you learn not to be precious with your writing, firstly, on that for that reason. You have to make changes based on what you are able to get through production. But also you learn to accommodate change and you learn to problem solve. This actor's dropped out, this actor can't do this day. Okay, well we'll have to rewrite the scene, but they have some key story threads that need tying up. How are we gonna do that? Okay, well we could uh we could write in a new character, we could slightly change the dialogue to fit we could add a scene but with different characters you know it's all that sort of stuff that's really useful for when it comes to actual professional work yeah it sounds like as well when you have no budget you've got to be more creative that's it than when you have a budget totally yeah so when you have a budget 
you're able to sort of go, do we really need to spend, do we really need to blow up that car or can we spend totally. that on something else? Totally. Can we hear it off screen and or we'll see the reaction shot rather than the car blowing up? And it's, it's great to have that mindset going into working on TV and film. But yeah, I don't actually probably both really equally in, in that you'll be with Veep or something, we'd be say running over and behind schedule and there's supposed to be a scene where Richard and Jonah are at a just uh, say a hardware shop okay what are we getting from that scene we can't we can't do that we can't we don't have time to go to a hardware shop anymore or to build that set so can we do it with them walking down a White House corridor yes basically (laughs) You just lose the jokes about hardware. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> some some innuendos would probably be in there somewhere, but um, you still get the same story points across, and you don't feel like you've really lost anything because you're just you're just streamlining and just just trying to make everything work and fit. And that does happen on big productions as well as on small, low budget stuff. What interests me about what you just said there is when I've written stuff or, or tried to write scripts, for me, I find if I lean so. I feel like with something like that, I've got two options. I can cut jokes or I can cut narrative. And often if I if I cut narrative, the thing just becomes a little bit more freeform but funnier. Yeah. And if I cut jokes, it, 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 you can follow the storyline, but there's maybe a bit more of a gap between each joke. Yeah. And, it, and you just said, like, you know, that often you'll cut, you'll keep narrative over jokes. Is that... It was that specific to a medium like a film or a TV thing, or is or is that just your personal preference, or how, how does that? It det- entirely depends on the project, really. I mean, we would always, if it was Veep, that the main focus is to just keep rewriting and rewriting until it's funny or funnier and as funny as possible. So you would you would remove those jokes, which might be if it was a hardware shop, those might be slightly easier to make than if it was just two characters walking down a corridor in the White House, which we've seen many times before. So you wouldn't be making observational jokes about mm. their surroundings unless it was you know, particularly relevant to the scene for some reason. You would try and, uh, and put jokes in. It would just be different jokes. It would just be something to do with what they're discussing rather than what's around them. Okay, so you meant you would just remove the jokes that are existing and put in new ones that are maybe shorter... Well, presumably they would be, if the scene was that you were cutting was in a hardware store, you would presumably have put the characters there for a reason. They need to buy a saw or whatever. You kind of remove that the purpose of that scene by saying, okay, Gary's gone and bought the saw. So now the, the jokes aren't about the saw or, you know, you could say, oh, you know, Jonah would say something like, oh, hopefully he cuts off his own head with it. You know, it's not really about that, the joke being about hardware stores anymore. You know, it's the narrative, the narrative point has been pushed forward without having to see the characters there. But fundamentally, if what you're making is a comedy, you have to try and push the jokes through. They are more important than the narrative, otherwise it just becomes a drama. When you're writing for different mediums, so let's say, uh, if, we, if we split them into, and you can change this around if, I'm, if, if you see it a different way, but let's say indie productions in general, so maybe short films or, or little projects like that, uh, TV, and film when you were first starting writing for in- indie productions for yourself obviously they're going to be a lot shorter and a lot more uh like you said less risk mm. involved for you and for anyone else involved when you first started writing for let's say veep what was it like a having to write with a new group of people i well i work a lot with a guy called george riley but i've worked i've worked on my own but also with various other writers i'm just wondering what it would have been like going from working with a friend essentially mm. to working with potentially household names or, or people that you've watched for years and and maybe how that felt or how that was for you to try and feel like you were needing to keep up maybe or it's yeah i mean it's basically you, the quality needs to be much higher for whatever you're submitting um so it's great for for getting better but it is really intimidating as well being in a room with people who've written some of my favourite shows over the last sort of 25 years is it is terrifying. Gradually you do, you get used to people and you just feel comfortable around them and that's when it's the better comedy always comes then. But yeah, you just have to up your game. I mean, it's, a, it's an incredible training ground. I would recommend anyone who can watch the shows that you love and try and 
kind of just as an exercise try and write in that style and try and try and make your work as good as that on paper you know when I was when I was like 14 13 14 I would watch stuff like peep show spaced and kind of write it out like handwrite it out just to see what it looked like and to see what the dialogue looked like written down and I found that really useful just for understanding the nuances of of why a joke lands and also how much of it is performance and how much of it is sort of trusting the voice of the character and the the actor providing that voice and how much of it is is just in the joke that you've written. Yeah, a lot of... um, We were talking about Edgar Wright before we started recording Mm. and a lot of his jokes, if I wrote them down, I don't think, even with direction, I don't think I'd find them funny. Because they're so visual at the time, especially in his films. Definitely, yeah. And and yes, and a lot of them are very reliant on the characters. Yeah. A lot of su- stuff that Simon Pegg does is so brilliant because of the way he performs it. And it's great if then he's writing it with Edgar or with um, Jessica Stevenson. Or is it Jessica Hines now? Jessica Hines, yeah. Because, because he knows what that voice of the character is already and he knows what he can do. And that, that is really brilliant writing. Because it's not just him, it's all of the others as well. It's it's whichever character Nick Frost is playing in the project. It's, you know, Martin Freeman. It's who's the, uh, Mark Heap. <laughs> um, oh, I like that guy. He's I've, great. He, he's one of these guys that I keep seeing popping up in things, like yeah. uh, Nigel Planer. You know, he just pops up yeah. in things and you think, oh, it's him. Yeah, he's there's a few of them, like Kevin Eldon as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where you just think, oh, God, they've done... They've Loads. been in everything that's yeah. great. It, it, that's good writing, understanding the voice, but pot- potentially slightly easier for writer performers because they they really know themselves inside out. Exactly. I mean, how how do you gauge whether something is gonna be funny just on paper and acted out? Usually, you try and do a table read fairly early on. Well, I suppose. Do you, do you want to, I, 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 just in case someone's listening who doesn't know what that is, I'm going to keep doing this just for all Yeah, jargon. yeah, yeah. Um, um, so it's basically you you print out whatever draft of the script you're on and then you get actors in. Might not be There might not be the final actors who end up being in the project even, but just people who fit the roles quite well in your mind so far as you've been developing them. And you get them just to read out what's on the page without direction, actually. And it just it's quite interesting because you get you get a feeling for the pace and for the voices in a much more clear way. Armando does that with all of his projects and it's uh, it's usually quite some way before you even start properly casting and it's really useful and and because he's because he's done it and I've seen how that process works I try and do it with everything that I'm involved in on my own because you do it just it leads to a more kind of naturalistic tone as well. You kind of can you can hear the comic beats and you can sort of see what doesn't work and it rather than hammering home a joke that you you really like but just when it's out in the air it just sounds shit right you just let it go you just go all oh, right now I get it now rather than in the edit six months later going oh that joke that I really wanted I really wanted it to work but I wouldn't I wouldn't let the actor change the wording so it it sounds weird and coming from their voice or their character wouldn't say it like that it just doesn't work it's better to just write around the character or at least a voice that that's um that sounds more like how the character will be so yes it's uh that's that's one way of doing it same with rehearsals i suppose a, a big question cuz cuz something that you you spoke about a bit before and kind of all of your answers have kind of alluded to is a breakdown of kind of your ego in relation to the to the writing yeah. so that you're not as you say, precious about it. And that's something that I think a lot of people when they first start writing, I know myself in particular, struggled with. Because, you know, if someone read it and they gave me negative feedback, even if it was constructive negative feedback, you know, I'd be like, well, they obviously just didn't get what I was saying. Or or I'd have this stupid defensiveness about it, which which now I know is foolish. It's like they're just trying to help and I've I've asked for it. Yeah. How, How do you detach yourself from your own work well you know it, it is hard because it's it's very it's very personal it's just come from from you so it's um it can be difficult but the thing is you you learn quite quickly that you just 
you just can't. You either have to shut off that part of your ego and um, try and see the good in whatever notes you're getting because that's just the process. No one, nobody goes through production without getting notes. Most of the time the notes are good and they actually add something and you, you just, you've just got to, sometimes they're not articulated particularly well, which is often actually where where things go wrong, where in text form, when someone receives an email, they read the notes and they can't sense the tone yeah. from just the written words. And also remember that an, uh, an executive might not might not be a writer themselves, so they might not um, they might have put something which sounds very blunt, but actually, if you were speaking it through with them, you would totally understand what they mean and see that they're not just being cruel just for the sake of it. <laughs> I mean, for me personally, when I was at university, well, I suppose my earliest stuff that I was making. It was for my art A level, so my I had a teacher, Miss Edmonds, Annie Edmonds, who's a brilliant art teacher who's done a lot for the arts in Bracknell for the last sort of well, for last sort of 35, 40 years, I think. She would just be unrelentingly cruel if I'd done something badly. But within understanding the context that I was a 16-year-old schoolboy doing this for the first time, so it wasn't just like that'll never be on TV because it's shit. It was more, well, within the context of you making something with a cheap video camera, you've really put the effort in in these areas, but you could have done another draft of the script and explored these issues in a slightly more sensitive way or whatever. Or you could have made that a bit funnier. or You know, so for me, I started with that. Then went to university, was was with a lot of people who, where we tried to read each other's work and tried to work together on stuff. And that was really useful as well. And then when I was, work, you know, working with Armando, the process is entirely collaborative in that you have about, with Veep, there were about a dozen writers and you all put stuff in and then it all gets rewritten constantly and it's on a sort of cycle. So you don't feel you don't feel ownership over your own bits. You feel ownership over the entire thing. But equally, you can't be precious at all because it's all going to get ground up by the machine. But overall, it will be it'll be so much better in the long run. And you have to think of it like, say you write a joke about rabbits and then on the next draft, that joke isn't there anymore. But Ian Martin has read it, gone, oh, had an idea off the back of that, which is then, he's then written an, an alt line that's gone in, which isn't, it's it's still to do with rabbits, but it's a different joke, a better joke. And then further along the line, that that joke will get cut in half and slotted together with some dialogue from somewhere else. And then that's, you know, dialogue by Georgia Pritchett or someone. And then that might be the final joke that comes out of the actor's mouth. And so in a way, by writing the rabbit joke in the first place, I'm reacting to what was ever, whatever was already on the page there. It sparked something in my brain. Then Ian's had an idea off the back of that that he wouldn't have had prior to reading the rabbit joke. And then George has had a totally different idea, which has then been merged with the rabbit. And so we all own that joke, which is great. I think, I think there's two things that have come out of that in, in my mind. So if I was listening to this, one of, one of the questions I'd be thinking right now is, say I had written a joke that got cut. Say, say I wrote a load of jokes and only one got through. Hmm. Would my pay for that project be dependent on how much writing ends up at the end? Because on the face of it, your portfolio hasn't moved along at all because you can't add, you can't say oh, I wrote that. You can't say I wrote a joke that got cut. That's not going to help you long term, is it? No, but the, the thing that does help you is that you are one of the names associated with the overall show. There's everyone is credited on every episode of Veep because it doesn't it's sort of not as a writer most people get like a consulting producer or supervising producer credit but you're still associated to it but you don't get paid per joke or anything like that it's more of a kind of you get paid a if you're on set you get paid a daily rate for HBO and if you're one of the official episode writers you get paid a kind of episode rate it's not really time dependent it's more or kind of gag rate dependent it's more just your getting paid officially for one draft but of course it never works out like that you end up doing lots of drafts and it's just the way it works <laughs> yeah and it's who wants to work with you again kind yeah of thing. so yeah. it kind of it kind of doesn't matter that on the face of it none of your work might that sounds really horrible but on the face of it none of your work might not make it to the end because the team you're working with might just want to work with you again because you've helped make that work. Tot- totally and and also your work is embedded in it anyway even if it's not the exact you know it's it's still it's still been reacted to within the final piece so it's still part of the process and yeah it's a great it is a great way of rubbing away at that 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 ego that some people have going in I, I think what I find interesting is um, as I've been writing more and more it's detaching my increased confidence in my ability mm. with my decreased ego 
to the end result. Mm. And uh, arguably, you, you might want to be modest at this point, but I don't mind, are doing a lot better than I am in terms of writer. And you have uh, been on teams which, which have won awards. Um, you, you yourself have been put forward for certain awards for in, indie work that you've done. H- how do you... A, what does that really do for your career? Like, what what does an award really offer you in real terms? And B, how do you stop that from making that ego come back? Well, in terms of with with the awards, it kind of depends on what the award is. With interestingly, with Veep, I I would get quite a lot of meetings off the back of Veep, but none of them ever really went anywhere. Whereas I won a competition called the BAFTA Rockcliffe new writing competition in uh, April. That was for a, an hour-long drama script. It's sort of comedy drama. and So that was just a script that wasn't made? That was it? just a spec okay. script that I just wrote and submitted and then was lucky enough to, to be one of the ones that made it through to the very end. That's actually opened a lot more doors for me than Veep ever did, interestingly. Possibly because it's, it is a, a, a written example of what I do where you can just see it, you can just see the, the the unfiltered kind of work on the page, rather than like you say, going. I wrote that joke and that joke, or I wrote a joke that led to that joke. <laughs> um, it's much more clear what your voice is if it's a script that you've written by yourself. So for that, it's been great. I mean, it's it's led to a couple of couple of things. Um, what was the what was the other part of the question? I can't remember. How you stop your ego from coming back as a result of getting some level of I don't want to say critical acclaim because that's but you know it, yeah you, you, you are getting an e- I assume you get an ego everyone from, everyone yeah. has everyone has an ego though it's just it's just trying to generally be a decent person in your life isn't it I think it's all kind of connected it's I, I think for me I just try and I don't know I don't I just think of I don't really think of myself as being like anyone <laughs> I just, I'm just myself, and it's great if stuff happens or if I get to be involved in these incredible projects. But I don't know. I just feel like I sort of know what I can do to some degree, and I don't think I'm necessarily the best. But what I do think is that I'm willing to work very, very hard, and that's probably why I've managed to do okay. Whereas lots of people that I know who who were at university, I was at university with, who are much, much better writers than me haven't done anything but it's because they weren't willing to go and be runners for five years and have a difficult time where you don't get paid anything and you get treated like shit for for no money and practically starve you know that that does a lot for it as well you know for me personally I just think think back to how I how things were when I was a runner and how hard it was and you know it that just makes me think well I'm just really lucky, so I'm not going to be. I'm trying not to be a dick. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the best advice everyone gives to everyone. Where they go, just stop being a dick. Yeah, I think. I think. I feel like that's what people are trying to tell me when they do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would say like if you have like ego issues or insecurities or anger problems, what I would say is just just rather than reacting instantly, just just take a second. Just think to yourself, I'm taking a second. I'm thinking normally just have a take a breath and then just reassess because the chances are you'll then not be a dick you know that goes for when someone when a cyclist almost runs you over you know right through to if you're if you get notes from a from a commissioner and they're not exactly what you hoped for don't write the email don't write the email or if you do don't send it don't even write it on your emails write it in a separate word document and then promptly delete it (laughs) <laughs> when you feel over you've got over it or wait a day wait overnight sleep on it don't instantly react ever I, i'd say that's that would be useful for most people and I, I think a lot of one of the problems you know to take it full circle one of the problems with with twitter and facebook is that people do react instantly and they feel that they should and people feel like people in the public eye often feel that they have to say something and that's often why it ends up being a garbled message that isn't actually making the point that they want and sometimes is more offensive than what they initially wish to say. I mean, I think this will come out in a few months, but we're recording this the week after the Harvey Weinstein allegations were made. And a couple of days after that all came out, James Corden made some some jokes Stupid at an comments. event. I don't even call them jokes. Well, yeah, yeah I mean, that, maybe that's the most controversial part of it, calling them jokes. But it's like... It's like because he's in the public eye and he was at 
an event he sort of had to with hollywood people it's like he had to say something about it it's it's that it's it's kind of it's kind of going well just have a think about this don't go with the easy joke you know just 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 step back from it have a think about it properly which he clearly hadn't done and then afterwards after the the massive backlash he clearly did do and went oh god i'm so sorry because he'd actually thought about it like a human being rather than just a robot spewing dialogue. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, I to try and get he, I, laughs. Yeah, I thought he was trying to be Ricky Gervais. You know, I thought he was trying to do that. Exactly, kind of thing. And, yeah. Exactly. And he's not that. Even, yeah. if he, even if those jokes were said by Ricky, it wouldn't have worked. It's just a weird kind of... Yeah. Yeah, but I, I know what you're saying about the reactionary thing. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like you get quite a lot of, or, or you intermittently get opportunities to do different types of projects, both independent and mainstream. What part does your agent play in that then? She she doesn't set up stuff really. Occasionally she'll she'll say, "Oh, this person's interested in meeting you," so she acts essentially as a her office organises a meeting between me and a producer or whatever. But on the whole, most stuff comes about as a result of me having met people or them having seen my work or reading a script or whatever. So it kind of depends. I mean, she's really she's really there as a sort of protector, so that when something does start happening with a project. I'm not tricked into working on it for free for no reason or for signing away all my rights to it. So she's she's sort of there as a um, legal aid. <laughs> yeah. and, and also she's there as the person to be horrible to a producer so that I don't have to or to a director or whoever it is. Because you want to retain these relationships because at the end of the day it is most stuff gets made because of money. At least everything that I'm involved in that gets made that my agent would be involved in is being made to make someone profit somewhere. So everything comes back to money and it shouldn't really be you, the creative, who's talking about money with the people who are paying you. That's for your agent to do because it's awkward and it's horrible and you don't want to, you know, it. that's just, it's just a better way of doing it. So how, how did you pick her out of, were there other options? <coughs> other? Well, I think five of the Veep writers were at Casarotto. I'm with Lottie Beasley at Casarotto. And yeah, Roger Drew, Sean Gray and Will Smith. And am I missing one? I don't think so. Were with uh, with Abby Singer. And I think Lottie used to be Abby's assistant years and years ago. But Lottie represents Ian Martin, who's probably one of the greatest living writers. He and I get on very well. And so... I felt like tonally my work would be perhaps more suited to be sold by her than by anyone else. It is important to pick the person who's right for you because, I mean, this is a, this is sort of an ego thing, I suppose, in that you, if you want to be a Hollywood writer, even if now you, you haven't had anything on television or you've never made a film, there's no point in going and getting an agent who, who represents Hollyoaks writers who plan to make a career in the soaps because that's you'll end up having to fire that agent eventually which which is its own difficulty and you know it's never it's never a pleasant thing as far as i can tell from people i know who have had to get rid of their agents but great if you want to go and work in the soaps but there's it's it's that it's same thing as if you're an actor don't go if you want to go and do theater for the rest of your life great but go with an agent who who is supportive of theater don't go with an agent who wants to get you into adverts and and you know it's 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 that it's kind of knowing where you want to go and what you want to do in the long run and realistically who will get you there and Lottie is one of the best agents for comedy writers doing sitcoms and comedy films in the UK so it's it's a no-brainer really would you say it's normal for a writer to get opportunities themselves rather than their agent and if it is how would you advise new people to get past that first barrier of getting their first credit so that they get those opportunities it's it's definitely much more in the in the writer's court than the agents yeah you, you need to go out and get your own stuff really in terms of uh, getting past the first stage you know in order to get an agent or to get people to read things just send it out just write stuff and send it out but don't don't send people anything unless it's the best it's going to be and you sincerely believe it's the best it's going to be because it will save everyone a lot of time and often people will only read the first thing that you send them they won't bother again because it does take a lot of time to read stuff so don't yeah d- d- but there's no there's no excuse really i mean you can you can make anything um that'll be polly being hoping that we're gonna wrap this up 
Yeah, she's jingling keys. Um, Sorry. <laughs> um, like you're doing, you've you've bought the sound equipment, which you've presumably done by doing some work in the real world and earning money. It's the same thing. To be a runner, when I first was running, I had I was used up about two grand of my savings that I'd earned from a cleaning job and various other things that I'd done, temp work, because that's how much it cost to get the train in and out of London. And I was in Bournemouth or to find somewhere, stay in a hostel or whatever overnight if I was working two days in a row. That's how much it cost. And I only was able to do that because I'd already saved up money from working in a, in the real world, inverted commas. And and I think it's the same thing. You know, if you, you can buy a DSLR and film stuff yourself with your mates, but you do have to be able to buy it in the first place. So you probably going to have to do some work to do that or unless you have generous parents or <laughs> some wealth from somewhere else but um that's that's what it takes i only got in because i'd already done work and saved up money and so i could afford to lose money by going and being a runner and doing work experience when i was a runner here the amount of money i was mo- i was earning per day was less than the train fare and that was at a big film company <laughs> you know and it, it's it's uh, it's that and i it's very hard that is the reality if you want to be a writer, you stand a better chance of being in the rooms with people, the right people, if you are, if you have been a runner and you've worked with them. If you're a sense, if you seem like a decent person, and you're a runner and you've written a great script, then the chances are the producers that you're working with will go, "Yeah, you seem like a really nice guy, and we really like the amount of work and effort you've put in over the last six weeks on this shoot." Of course, we'll read your script. They may not get around to it for a little while, but they probably will eventually. And if it is the next Geostorm, <laughs> I don't know, they'll probably buy it. Mm. Like, th- there's nothing holding you back other than being in the room with these people. And if they like you, they'll, they're will they more likely to read your work. Equally with the competitions, you know, the BAFTA competition, it's entirely anonymous. So you just submit the work. And if it's good enough, and it goes through the various stages of readers and a jury and all this stuff, then it might win. And then you get opportunities off the back of that. Yeah, and, and currently you're, you said, you told me, uh, we, can, we can kind of talk about it, but you're, you're working on a sitcom with Hattrick. Yeah, which came actually off the back of, um, of the BAFTA thing. Yeah, it's a, it's a sitcom set in a shit university on the south coast. Bournemouth? Yeah, it is actually, yeah, yeah. weirdly. Uh, um, <laughs> was, was this a script that you'd been working on and you, you just sent no, it through? Or, no, no, or no, we came to you devised and... it from scratch, um, okay. which is, yeah, it's great. It's uh, They read the BAFTA script, but they already had something that they were in development with, which was a similar story with, a, I think, a similar tone. But Mark Talbot, who is the producer that I've been dealing with there and uh, Tom Jordan liked my voice from that script so they wanted to do something in, in a similar in a similar tone but um, just a totally original idea so I wanted to do I was thinking about when I, I used to be a cleaner a cleaner for Bracknell Forest Council and one of the places that you'd clean was at school so you would be a cleaner at your own school <laughs> which is quite yeah. quite depressing um, <laughs> doesn't sound fun no so I was thinking that but you know what if it was someone who'd gone to uni- a university that they've ended up being a cleaner in it's sort of I want also wants to do something about the way that the media portrays uh, the Middle East and Syria and refugees so another character in it is a British uh, Syrian born but British Syrian who went back to Syria for university and was planning on becoming an academic, but has had to return to the UK without any qualifications because of everything that's happened. And so he's forced into working at this shit university with his old school friend who went to the university. So one of them one of them got qualifications from the place. The other one should really be a professor and is and is uh, stuck doing this uh, this job that he hates. So it's it's fun. It's it's sort of campus comedy, but but told in a, a slightly different way. I mean, it, it's going to sound like a, probably a cliche question, but everyone has a different answer. How are you finding time to juggle each project? Because it sounds like you're, do, you're doing a lot of these in tandem. 
and yeah. and for them to approach you obviously you don't want to give up that opportunity how are you able to stay creative and still juggle projects i just try and schedule my days very carefully i, I have a vague idea you know it, it's easy it's good if you have a deadline because then whether you set it yourself yeah. or whether they someone else sets it and you you just kind of go okay well i need to finish that by then it's going to take I think it will roughly take me 10 hours to get this redrafted or whatever. I'll set aside two hours every evening over the next five nights to do that. And I will not go to sleep until I've done that two hours on it. That is, that's the way you do it. Again, it's the same thing of you just have to work really hard, unfortunately. Boring answer, but you, you know, often I'll kind of get up at six and do an hour on whatever project it is and then get ready, have breakfast and stuff go into the office and do a day's work with Armando and then often I'll stay an hour after he's left, try and do an hour on one of my projects or carry on with whatever we've been doing and then walk home, think, think on the way home, listen to a podcast or go to the gym and listen to some other people talking about something completely different for a bit and then get home and uh, have dinner, have a break, watch something on TV for half an hour. Then usually I'll try and do two or three hours of work and then go to sleep. And it just depends. At the moment, I've got a few deadlines. So at the moment, I'm working till very late and just trying to fit as much in as possible. But it's, uh, yeah, it just it's just varied depending on how many projects there are. But you just have to you just have to do them, I think. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, know, I know we have to wrap up, but I'll ask you one last question. Sure. Um, if, uh, what do you think is the biggest... Um, let's say, what, what do you think is the biggest problem in the writing side of comedy and how would you go about solving it? I think both in writing and generally in the industry, it's an issue of diversity. As I was saying, you know, it's very hard to be able to afford to get into this world. And so what that does, whilst this... I think we're doing quite well for diversity on screen now, probably more so in Hollywood than than in the UK. Behind the scenes, it is very restrictive and it is basically, you you can only get in if you've got parents who live in London, where most of the work is, or you can afford a car so you can be driving to the sets and to the studios, or you've got some money already and so you, you can burn through that whilst you're losing money <laughs> and pay pay some rent or something but yeah that is the main that's the main problem and there is there is very little diversity it's more it's more financial diversity than you know i would say which of course has implications to do with with kind of class but that that's the major issue the people that i see coming up at the moment runners that i meet are almost all like so many of them are oxbridge which is interesting because it's it shows that there isn't there clearly isn't the the same springboard as there was five, six, seven, eight years ago, where usually a lot, I knew a few, fair few people who were Oxbridge who didn't have to do running. They kind of slipped in at researcher level or were production assistants or whatever. Whereas, so they, those, it's obviously harder to get in now than it was. But, but, but also, of course, a lot of people who are at Oxbridge are also fairly well off because you usually have to be to go there in the first place. So it's all a kind of wider problem with being able to afford to work in the industry, which is such a stupid question. It means that we end up, overall, as people come up gradually, you are, you end up with less diverse stories being being told on screen. It makes no commercial sense whatsoever. The Americans have worked it out. You know, they, they're lucky in that they have very strong unions. So once you kind of just, once you get in, you're kind of okay. You're, you're protected by your union on the whole. Whereas over here, we don't have anything really. So you have no protection and it's much harder to, there's no HR departments that you can go and complain to. And if they are, they're your line producer on a production that's lasting for a couple of months. So it's so, it's so fluid anyway that they you know, that it'll all be over before anything gets changed. Yeah, the Americans have worked out that uh, stories about women sell. Stories that are about black characters sell. You know, this stuff sells. And it's idiotic that we don't do more of it here. One of the reasons we don't is because there is very little diversity coming up because it's it's very hard for people to get in. So I think that it's not as simple as diversity in writing or an issue to do with writing. I think it's it's from the ground floor up. And it is the responsibility of people who are in positions of power to make sure that their staff are paid properly. It makes everyone happier. It makes everything better. It makes the whole job easier. On a 
sort of production level you're putting your production at risk if you're sending a rushes runner who is being paid five pounds fifty an hour to who has been up since 4 a.m to drive your rushes from location to london when you wrap at midnight <laughs> who are, who's exhausted because they can't afford a hotel room so they're sleeping in their car you're putting them at risk but you're also putting production at risk because the rushes everything you've just shot that day on that 500 grand day that you've just been filming with 100 extras is in the back of that car <laughs> which is going to crash maybe yeah. i I don't know. I mean, I'm not in any position. I'm still new, you know, I'm still relatively new to the industry. And But I think it's important to try and have these conversations with people. And um, uh, I'm still fresh off, fresh enough to, to remember quite clearly what it was like being a runner and being and how hard it was. I know, I know a lot of people who wouldn't have been able to do that because they're not, because they weren't able to save money because they need that money to go towards their family's rent or the mortgage or whatever. So, um, yeah, <laughs> bit of a serious way to end it. Sorry, it's not, it. it's not been a very funny interview, really. It's all right, Sorry. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> You've listened to a few. Um, thank you for coming on. Thank you. That was Peter. A lot of guests come on the show and directly after recording say, was that all right? Or I bet I sounded boring or something similar to that. Peter was no exception to this, but I found in the edit finding myself becoming increasingly excited to work on more projects just because I like making things and I like learning from the process of making things. And also it's just great to have things made in a portfolio that shows both your artistic creativity and your skill set. It was great to listen back to because you can have the best cover letter of all time, but if you haven't got the skills to do the job, you're not gonna get the work. So I really liked this episode and I really found it quite interesting. And I hope you got as much out of it as I did, especially uh, as now I'm probably going to go on a short social media break so I can take a day or two so I can write a script for a web short that I've been thinking about for a while. Uh, so thanks for that, Peter. Having said that, when I come back after sort of 20 minutes of not being online, I will want some sort of online validation. So if you haven't already, please do hit that subscribe button as I do two new episodes a month, one on the first and one on the third Friday. If you've been listening for a while, please do give the show an honest, positive, ideally review in iTunes. Uh, if you have a negative comment about the show, email me or tweet me don't put it up there but if you have something positive to say please do that i get loads of messages and tweets from people saying to me they love the show just copy and paste that and put it in itunes it really helps the show out and i can't thank you enough i do understand that not everyone wants apple having their details so it's no biggie if you don't want to do it just share this episode or share an episode that you got some value from and you think your followers or your friends on facebook will as well i would say tweet pete but probably won't like that so just mention me and i'll pass it on to him at this made me cool that's my twitter handle if you wanted to donate to keep the show going please do you can do that on paypal or on patreon if you can donate per episode i only did two a month so if you can afford two dollars a month to keep the show going that would massively help out and if you wanted to do a one-off donation of more than five pound then you can get a copy of my book it's called how to make a living by working for free and it's about building audiences online around your free content so if you're listening to this and you're thinking about donating sort of made my point haven't i I've built an audience and I've got people who want to donate. So if you want to be one of those people, please do that. Five pound, get a digital copy of that book and it will tell you all the things that I've learned, but all the things that I've learned from talking to people about how they've created their audience and how they've started earning money from their free content and how they've built businesses around the audiences that are interested in the same things as them. So uh, please do buy that if you want to. And there's also a free sample of it on my website. And if you scroll back through, there's an audio of me reading out the first chapter. Or I think it was a little while ago now about eight months ago so have a look at that so if you want to have a listen if you want to have a copy that's the best way of buying that or you can do what pete did and delete all your social media profiles and just send me a fiver just because you want to support the show either way i don't mind it's totally up to you live your life the way you want thank you very much for listening thank you very much for sharing and thank you very much for rating and donating if you do i'll see you all in about 14 days time bye